We are here at the Penley Ranch in Douglas County, west of Sedalia, Colorado. Today is Saturday, June 20th, 2020. My name is Mark Stevenson. I represent the Highlands Ranch Historical Society. And today we will do an oral history with a very important person in the history of Highlands Ranch, Gary Devis. Gary was the community manager of the Highlands Ranch Community Association for 20 years, starting in 1991. So Gary has taken us today to a ranch where he has cattle grazing in Douglas County called the Pendley Ranch, which history goes back to the 1870s at this point. So Gary, welcome. Thank you, Mark. So tell me a little bit about yourself, first of all. Where were you born? <laughs> A little bit about your education, where you grew up, that type yeah. of thing. I'm, I'm originally, I'm a native of Colorado. I, uh, one of the few. One of the few. I was born in Sterling, Colorado, and, and our family had a ranch and farm near Proctor, Colorado, which is a little whistle stop um, along the, the South Platte River, uh, about 25 miles northeast of Sterling. So that's where I'm from. Um, I uh, graduated from Caliche High School, which was a, a country school, which was a consolidation of three small town schools. And it was really interesting when you take three bitter rival t small towns and throw them into one to see who's going to be quarterback of the football team. So that was that was a lot of fun and, and you an interesting time. I was a quarterback, yes. And, yeah. and um, following that, I had the opportunity to, to go to the Colorado School of Mines. I have a mining engineering degree. Uh, and. Uh, funny how things happen in your life when you find the, your real calling and the things you love to do and uh, my engineering degree has taken me a long ways because I like to fix problems in advance of them happening and so that's a lot of why I, I got into community management. Were you ever able to use your education in mining in the mining field? I did. I, uh, I actually put myself through college um, working underground in several different mines in Idaho Springs and Georgetown and then the lead, uh, lead South Dakota, the Homestake Mine which was at the time North America's largest underground gold mine and uh, uh, worked 5,000 feet underground with 1,100 other people and just loved it. I mean, that's uh, part of the story of how you, you put a kid through school when you do it yourself. So. And you lived to tell about it. <laughs> and I lived to tell about it. Although there were some close calls from time to time. <laughs> and I probably didn't even realize it when I was young like that. We're all bulletproof at that point in our lives. What was your first professional job? Uh, my first professional job, um, besides I did some consulting things in, in mining for um, uh, quarry operations and gravel operations for road projects. So I, I did that as a almost a part-time thing, but my per first professional job was working in county government out in Logan County. After I graduated from college, I moved back and uh, to, to run a ranching operation and start one of my own. Um, and I got a little bit bored. I have a tendency to do that and I start new things and I just keep doing it and doing it and doing it. And I got into county government and um, at first it was just doing some mapping work because I had an engineering background and drafting background for the assessor's office and the, I became a, a, a land appraiser. And then I was promoted to the county planning director, um, which I enjoyed. And one day uh, one of the county commissioners said, hey, we don't know whether we want to promote you or demote you but how would you like to be the county manager for our county? And so that kind of started me down that path. My wife and I at one point then looked at, um, you know, we're, we were always doing economic development projects in, in uh, that county. And uh, one day I was looking at her and said, you know, I always tell people we're only two hours from Denver. We're two hours from Denver. And it, it just so happened that that next week I was looking through the, what was then the Rocky Mountain News my favorite paper, paper still. <laughs> I wish it was still here. Um, and I saw this ad, uh, just a little tiny ad that said community manager, Highlands Ranch. Um, and I thought, well, I wonder what that would be like. I don't, I'm not even sure what that is. I remember when I was in college, C-470 was just being completed. And this little place called Highlands Ranch had just started. And I thought, you know, let's just see what happens with that. And so I, I submitted a letter of interest and a resume. And I had a phone call one evening. Um, uh, from a person named Michael Cook and my wife said well what how, how was he and I said well I'm not sure Michael is a man because he, <laughs> she sure seemed to have a feminine but raspy voice and uh, I had a chance to have an interview with the board and, and Michael 
um, was the president of the board. She was a wonderful lady. She became county commissioner in Douglas County shortly after I was hired and, and fortunate enough to land this job in this wonderful little community called Highlands Ranch. Who else interviewed you for the job? Um, there were several people, Bill Carey, Paul White, um, Howard Wichter. Uh, they were all members of the board at that time. The, the board had just become 100% uh, homeowner controlled. Before that, it had been a board of, of Mission Viejo Company executives and some, some uh, folks from the community, but it was really interesting to uh, you know, Mission Viejo Company didn't have to turn over that or transition the community to the homeowners at that point in time, but they did because they thought it was a, a good thing to do. So in 1991, after Michael interviewed you and accepted you, you started the job and I assume you moved to Denver. Did you move to Highlands Ranch? We did. Um, we wanted to live in the community where we worked. And uh, uh, my wife at the time was working at the Jefferson County Attorney's Office, running the administrative function of that attorney's office and so she would commute to Golden and I would um, commute to my office in Highlands Ranch and it took me about as long to ride my bike to the office as it did to drive and that was a pretty good thing. Who built your house? Our original house was um, Village Homes and we've owned four different homes in Highlands Ranch over the years uh, and we still own one there today so it's, it's, it's been a fabulous community for us we've enjoyed it we raised our children there um, fully ingrained in all the life and, and lifestyle that, that happened in Highlands Ranch. I had many peers in, in our industry that would say, Gary, why would you ever live where you work? Because you're going to have people bothering you all the time, and, and especially in an association management role. But I can tell you it was fabulous for me. I got to meet so many people. I learned what they liked and what they didn't like, and I learned how diverse our community was culturally, racially, you name it. We did things to, that were outside of the norm, and I think that was one of the most fun things for me, that we lived there. Um, not everything was for everyone, but we had something for everyone, and that was the goal. Uh, there was not a model anywhere in the world, let alone in this country, of something where you would build over 30,000 homes over a period of time with one master developer, and that would have one association and we created things that had never been done. We made it up as we went. There weren't a lot of rules or laws that applied to us at that time in Colorado, but it was interesting for me because I would serve on legislative action committees or I would go to testify in front of the legislature on development matters and association matters. And inevitably, someone on one of the legislative committees would say, well, we don't want this to be like Highlands Ranch. And I'd have to explain how we did it in Highlands Ranch. And it changed their opinions. And so we were... We were the leaders. There are a lot of misconceptions about what Highlands Ranch is and what Highlands Ranch is not. Yeah, that's absolutely true. And over the years that I was in Highlands Ranch, I mean, when we started, when I started there, you know, there weren't that many homes. And it was, it was fun to talk to the people that moved there. And they would say, you know, we got told, we, and we never thought we'd move to Highlands Ranch. And we had a realtor that said, come out and see a few of the homes here and part of the amenities and what goes with this community. And we fell in love with it, and they still live there today. And I think that's the real testament of a vision that not only the Mission Veo Company people had, but all of the, the people that became involved in the association and the other, the other entities in Highlands Ranch that make that community what it is. Um, over the, the time that I was there, I mean, in, in terms of the, the committee members we had, uh, the delegates and the board members, I know I worked with more than a thousand different people. And so when you put that, and, and my original thought was when I, I went to my first meeting and we had like 20 delegates sitting in the room and the board meeting was after that, and I thought, how, this may not work out very well for me. I, you know, I'm not sure you can ever get to a point where you can get that many people to a consensus. Um, but when it <laughs> what it turned out to be was that, you know, when you have that many viewpoints, we learned as a team of, of staff people how to make those presentations, to take the philosophical arguments out. Here's the raw good data, and people would use their own judgment to help us shape that into something that was gonna be workable for the community. And I, I remember sitting with the board of directors one day, we were doing kind of a, let's do a strategic plan, and, and, you know, or a five-year plan, and I don't think in a, in a community that developed as quickly as Highlands Ranch, five-year plan would ever work. <laughs> one year at a time was pretty much, as, you were always catching up and we wanted to plan ahead. And we were talking about what is our vision and, and, 
and when and, and mission and when you do those kinds of, of charrettes or round tables you know you, you can wordsmith things and wordsmith things and finally some uh, one of the board members from me Gary what do you think it is and I said yeah, we're trying to build a lifestyle here in the area and that stuck and that was our our new mission and our vision and um, some of the, the things that we did over time um, we didn't have a really culturally diverse program or background of what we were doing in Highlands Ranch. We'd, we'd get developer money from Mission Bay Company to shoot off some fireworks and have a celebration with an activities committee. But we didn't do the fun, fun concerts and a lot of those things. We didn't necessarily have the money all the time. And so we created, um, it was, it was an, a thought I had that again, once again we were kind of told, we're not sure you can get this done, but we created a 501c3 organization called the Highlands Ranch Cultural Affairs Association to put on concerts and plays and a multitude of other cultural activities that diversified and started to give somebody something they could enjoy no matter what it was. And, and that was the, the creative aspect and the fun of what we got to do. Um, those. I remember the first concert we put on, I think we had 14 people show up out in the park back behind the Northridge Recreation Center. And I had a board member say, well, we're not sure this is going to work. This may not have been worth the money. Um, and I said, well, let's, let's just give this a little time. And now today, um, those, col those concert series still happen out in Highland Heritage Park, and you might have 5,000 people there. So it's, it's an absolute blast. And it what a like blessing. It looks like now they're redoing that area. Yeah, they are. And, yeah, that's, that's part of uh, the community is a little over 30 years old now and so having those things continue and, and to have the financial power and background and and again that went with financial planning all the way through from from the developer the association the county the metro district to be able to have the funds in place over time to be able to not only build a community but to, but to maintain it and let it enhance it at, uh, over time so that the people that as things change People change, trends change, um, and we had to be ready for that. So that was, again, part of the creative juices that flowed that, that helped us all get to where we are. Let's go back to 1991 when you start, and you indicated that it went from a, a developed community developer-oriented board to a community-oriented board. The structure of delegates. Mm -hmm. and that whole thing, the representation within the community, was that in place when you started or did you start that? No, it was in place. That was uh, part of the, the, the governing documents would, would allow the developer, the declarant that they're called, to set up delegate districts. And in the original years there weren't really sub-associations that went with it other than some of the townhome communities. Um, over time there were sub-association areas that maybe are 1,400 homes. And so the voting power of that delegate goes along with how many lots they actually represent. And they were done that way. Some people thought, oh, it should be one person, one vote. But think of it as shareholders in a company because that's what the association is. It's a nonprofit corporation. And those delegates vote with the number of shares that they represent or the number of lots. Activities came up after you started. What were the first significant things that got built? <laughs> First things that got built. Realizing in 91 when you started, there was only one rec center. Right. In this case, Northridge, the original rec center. Right. And it, there had been a small expansion prior to me getting there, but it, we had quickly outgrown even that expansion capacity. And so what was happening, we had, you know, we were taking racquetball courts that were there and converting them into uh, rooms for cardiovascular and weight activities and we were losing amenity space while we we're trying to create something for people so it got a little bit difficult um, we had people that would argue about what we should do and that was at the point in time where we didn't really have funding to go out we still owed a, a big debt to Mission Viejo company for that expansion. Well, we started again and the first uh, question was what were the first significant accomplishments of things that you were building or changing when you started? All right. Number one, when I, uh, one of the, the real shortcomings of our community as we had started to rapidly grow again after the oil bust in the 80s was that our recreation center, the Northridge Recreation Center, was the original plus a small addition. We, our community had quickly outgrown it and our community wanted activities, they wanted fitness areas, they wanted multi-purpose rooms in addition to racquetball. And so, you know, I started this uh, idea of 
you know, I, I, coming out of county government, we had done certain bond issues to do things. Well, we weren't a public agency, so tax-exempt financing was not available to us as an association because we're a private entity. It's for the members only. It's not open to the general public, anyone from outside the community. And so I started this thought process with a, an investment banking firm in downtown Denver, George K. Baum. And with a couple of gentlemen from there, Dick Fontaine and Alex Brown, we explored an idea of um, issuing tax, taxable bonds on a private placement basis. And it, it took almost two and a half years to get through that process. And there were several reasons for that, but we were ultimately successful. Initially, we were told by some investment advisors to Mission Viejo Company and others that this was a concept that wasn't going to work. Um, but being a, a ranch kid, you know, I, I learned the, the tough way of how to, how to do things. Um, I just thought, you know, if there's a will on something like this, there's got to be a way. And I can remember putting on my, my suit and tie and flying to New York City, and we had to go meet with bond agencies and, and sitting at Standard & Poor's office in lower Manhattan on Broadway uh, on a day we, we're explaining how this is all going to work and why we should get a, be able to get an investment grade bond rating for our community. And um, there was a, a lady that came in and started talking to one of the gentlemen on this side of the table and another lady came in and talked to a lady on this side of the table and they started leaving. And I'm sitting there thinking, was it something I said? That was the day that Orange County, California actually went bankrupt. So it delayed our project a little bit. But I remember the Standard & Poor's people and some people from MBIA, which is a bond insurance firm, wanted to come out and visit Colorado and see this place called, that we called Highlands Ranch. Um, they had no idea the scale. They had no idea of what the capacity of, of funding could be from, from someone that was forward thinking and looking down the road about how to bond debt into the future to pay off uh, a debt we had to Mission Viejo Company and to develop funding that would allow us to build some additional amenities. And we had to go around to a variety of different businesses and, and go to Mission Veo Company's offices and meet with the executives. And I remember them wondering, who, who is this Gary Debus guy? And, and we're walking into the, we can, we're walking into the uh, Mission Veo Company offices and they're not sure if I'm real yet or if this is a fake sales scam. And, out of out of this big office building comes this UPS guy and he goes, "Hey Gary, how's everything today?" And they just looked around like, "Who is this guy?" But we, but it was very fun. And so through all of that, all the professional people that were involved in our development project met with these folks, and ultimately we were the first community association in the country to ever be able to issue taxable bonds of this way. Um, we also did it a second and third time for, for the, the Recreation Center at Westridge and the Recreation Center at Southridge. But the most important part of that is by bonding debt into the future so that all the homeowners in the future help pay for those amenities, we were able to keep assessment levels flat and constant for quite a few years, even during the high growth. So it was, it was a stroke of brilliance that was purely luck, uh, but it, it worked out really well for everyone. And, and that's, again, the the hub of that community are those recreation centers. That's where the, the community gathering places are. You know, if you buy property in Highlands Ranch, uh, you're going to pay dues for the community centers. Is that correct? That is correct. And the assessments are, are structured so that, um, you know, it's a benefit to everyone. You may not use a, a facility or you may not use this, but in the end, the the philosophy behind good community associations is that they are structured and set up to maintain and enhance the value of your property. So your home values increase faster than an area that doesn't have those kinds of amenities and doesn't have a strong association. And that's exactly what happened in Highlands Ranch. I can remember in 1995, um, the number of new homes that closed in that year were 2,500. That's bigger than most small cities total uh, in population in, in Colorado. So we were, I mean, it was booming and, and we never had the opportunity really to say, let's think about what we're going to do tomorrow. We had to be planning what we were going to do a year out easily because things moved that quickly and we had to service those people and help, help them enjoy their lives and, and their investment that they had in, in Highlands Ranch. So with that rate of growth in North Glen, excuse me, Northridge Rec Center, <coughs> 
uh, capacity being exceeded. Uh, I'm sure you saw that there's a need for more and that you have the bond issues to talk about future development mm -hmm. projects. Tell me how the first rec center that you built after Northridge was Eastridge. Mm -hmm. How did that process go? The process is yeah. The process is fascinating. We built Eastridge and, and the outdoor pool at Westridge to start with, with that first series of bonds. And w after the funding was in place, which we weren't sure we'd be able to get, but it, it happened. Um, there was a community uh, committee that was set up. It was called the Future Facilities Committee, that met with all the special interest groups because there might have been somebody that wanted to play tennis only. There might have been somebody that wanted to swim laps. We were building facilities for communities. And you might have a tennis center in one area and a lap pool in another area, but they weren't, and no more than four miles apart at any given time. So it really wasn't like it was a huge deal. It was like, they're still very close to you. It's just not in your neighborhood. And that future facilities committee met with the various special interest groups. And then they also had the opportunity to, uh, we did um, community surveys where we would do these random surveys to every fourth household or every fifth household. So we had something that was, significantly or statistically significant and accurate and that allowed us to um, evaluate those numbers and see where is the most benefit to the biggest part of this community and how do we get all of these things done in different areas and so that data and that process we then utilized for the the recreation center at Westridge and then ultimately the recreation center at Southridge as well. So how long did the design work um, happen after you had tabulated the results of the survey and other input. Yeah, we did a, um, a, a great deal of um, design work prior to having the uh, bond issues completed. Now, it wasn't final design work, it wasn't construction document kind of things, but what we did was um, had uh, a design firm, um, St. Combs Deathless, they put together the concepts for us so that we could have pricing and we would know what we'd want to do with those facilities. And at that point is when we had, uh, we finished the con construction documents, hired a general contractor, Pinkard Construction Company, and away we went. And when we opened Eastridge, we did, uh, a, here's what, we, we did a soft opening where we again did a random, here's a number of people that we would allow to come into this facility just as an opening day. Fabulous, and it turned out so cool. And, and over time in those four recreation centers, we impacted 5,000 people a day on an average, and that's over 361 days a year, so you can see how valuable those community centers are to people. Okay. We were talking about the design process there in Highlands Ranch right. for the East Ridge Rec Center, and you're thinking that it was wildly successful in terms of the usage from the community. Yes, and it Right, and, and it was wildly successful in terms of the process. And so in the Denver metro area, there were a lot of other communities that were just starting and they were getting their homes built, whether it was a park and rec district or in another association. And they would come and visit our facilities. I mean, this is one of the most flattering things you can have, right? To look and see what you've done. And also to talk a, to us about the process that we used to get community input. And this is really before social media, you know, so you couldn't, do things the way we do, would do them today. Um, so we had to do it the hard way with the old fashioned US mail service um, to a large extent and then have people drop off the surveys they'd fill out. But it was really, a, a, I think, a great process that allowed community input and allowed us to be successful long term so that we didn't have uh, all the hiccups that you might have in other communities. And the fact that we had not just one facility and not just two, but we were gonna have four ultimately so even though something wasn't a high priority in the first couple, we might be able to add that to the third or fourth facility and get more bang for the buck as a collective community. It was brilliant in many ways. And the leaders and the visionaries that we had in our committees and on our boards, I, I can't give them enough uh, kudos, really. I mean, it was a lot of time, a lot of effort. And, you know, rarely do you get the kind of thanks that you, you like in that kind of a, an organization. but. Um, putting their names on those plaques that we talked about, are, that, that's ingrained in history. They were uh, the ones that went out on a limb and said, we think we can do this, and they relied on, on their, their team of experts and then people like me, who I'm not sure I'd call myself an expert, 
we had more fun there there I, you know there were no rules about how we would go about this in a community this size and one of the other flattering things that happened over time um, I was given the opportunity to make several presentations on very large master plan communities and certain trade organizations like the Community Associations Institute and I did one of these in Las Vegas about Highlands Ranch and the the accolades we received nationally because of that and we were published in a couple of, of magazines with our bond issues and how forward thinking that was and and the uniqueness and creative creativity of it and we all you know our, our finance committee would look at those things to make sure that our, our assumptions wouldn't be wrong and we wouldn't end up with an upside down community in terms of assessment levels uh, and it worked out according to plan which you know that's that's a true testament to the kind of talent that we had um, in those groups of people that volunteered their time and I, you'll you'll never hear me say the word HOA um, I I believe in especially in Highlands Ranch it was a true community association and, and yes while it might be a homeowners association it was HOA has so many negative connotations and I think community has so many positive connotations that's that's what was important to me and I you know our family you know, we lived in Highlands Ranch that entire time uh, we lived the the lifestyle that that we had helped create and um, had the opportunity to see people and talk to them all over the community about what they liked and what they, what they wanted to see in the future and we were able to accommodate those things the backcountry wilderness area being one of those um, in the early years that land was set aside and there were some 35 acre parcels that were allowed to be uh, to sold in to be sold in that area can you imagine the values of those 35s today the mission viejo company because of that they wanted development development vested rights in the northern half of the community um, set that special piece of land aside with a conservation easement and guaranteed in that uh, agreement that they would convey that property to the community association for the long-term benefit of the community and and its residents and you you see that today and it's it's a gem you don't find a piece of property like that in near or in as close to any metropolitan area as we have in Highlands Ranch so that was just such a fabulous um, stroke of, of brilliance on the ha behalf of Mission Viejo Company and the planning um, uh, directors for Douglas County at the time when Highlands Ranch was planned one of which being Tweet Kimball who we spoke about earlier um, at Cherokee Ranch and uh, the Bowen family you know it, it's just a, a really cool story that the uh, the people in, in charge of Mission Viejo Company were neighbors to these folks and treated them that way with respect. And that's how Highlands Ranch came about. Yep. Right at the same time Eastridge was opening, was a transition from Mission Viejo to Shea Homes. Yeah, uh, it was actually a little, did, bit, a little bit later. How did that go down and affect um, you and the community association? You know, it, it didn't really impact us that much. I mean, Mission Viejo Company sold their, their assets to, or they were acquired, I should say, by Shea Homes. Um, it slowed development down a little bit because the, um, the business philosophy between Mission and Shea was a little bit different, where uh, Mission was truly a developer in the later years when they owned the property, and Shea Homes wanted to be not just a developer, but also a home builder. And so there were some some hiccups probably you know although I think that they, they absolutely knew what they were doing because look at how it all turned out and changed a little bit of the housing product and, and mix in some of the newer neighborhoods and um, many of those Mission Viejo company employees and executives were picked up by Shea Homes and so there was continuity in that in that management team and so we didn't have you know a, the unexpected happen um, and we had the relationships built with those folks over years that over the years that allowed us to have that continuity and the, and the continuum of a plan even though there were modifications and adjustments mm -hmm. right about that same time Terry Nolan started with the Metro District yes how did the two of you guys get along and how did the organizations get along it seems that over the years from that time or possibly before that there's been some duplication of services that you both were in 
different areas, recreation, notably parks, whatever. Right. You know, um, I, I think through all of that, the, when, the, when there is discourse in, between organizations, ultimately you find the best solutions for everyone, and I think that's what happened in Highlands Ranch. Um, you know, and, and when you have people in charge of organizations like the Highlands Ranch Metropolitan District or the Highlands Ranch Community Association, they're probably going to be pretty strong-willed. Um, even though we're really good people, we're probably a little bit competitive, and that's not a bad thing. I think that made Highlands Ranch even better in the long run, and that's what the goal should have been and, and is today still. Yeah, it's been, from a homeowner's perspective, and I've been a homeowner since 1996, but uh, somewhat confusing. <laughs> you know, what does HRCA do? What does Metro District do? Does this park belong to Metro? <laughs> Who does the... Um, Highlands Ranch days at the Highlands Ranch Mansion, for example. Right. Uh, all those things are a bit confusing, but not awful. Well, they're not awful because, you know, and for most people that live in Highlands Ranch, the 93 or 94,000 people today, they probably don't care. They just want things, want services and want facilities and want programs. And, you know, in the early years, the Community Association did almost all of the community events. And Highlands Ranch Days is a great example. I mean, that I, I love that event. That was one of uh, my ideas that, you know, let's focus on what Highlands Ranch was in terms of a historical perspective and what it is today still, that there's still cattle ranching, there's still wildlife. Um, let's, let's get kids and families exposed to a lot of this. And, you know, we had um, the Tallbull family um, from the Tallbull Memorial Grounds up in Daniels sure. Park and some of the native dancers that would come out and, and perform for us. And we got to, you know, experience all of that. And then in partnership with the Metro District after they uh, became owners of the mansion and the grounds to continue those long-standing programs and traditions that, again, you know, I, I always looked at Highlands Ranch and what we did is how do we make memories for the people that live here, whether they be this big or whether they be 85 years old, what are they going to remember next year or 10 years or 20 or 30 years down the road? So from whether it was the, the rodeo concept that we, and again, that you, know, you see my hat, I, I'm a cowboy, I love that stuff. Um, we would set up these bleachers in a, in a portable arena and, and have rough stock rodeo events for 2,000 people over a couple of days, something that people would never get to see otherwise, perhaps. And, and I, I remember when, when the first rodeo we had, it was where um, uh, Valor Christian High School is today in Highlands Ranch that was still just a vacant piece of property that was being considered maybe for Walmart or something at the time. And we set up this arena and I'm out there and, and there's this mom that drives up in a minivan and she gets six little kids out there all from the neighborhood and she brings them over and she says, oh kids look at this beautiful horse. And it was a bareback bronc and he came out of that chute and he was growling and groaning and bucking and trying to bite the guy's foot that was riding him. <laughs> and she go, get back kids, that horse is crazy. It was one of the funniest things I've seen. It. But we, we started the mutton busting program with that so that, uh, and you know, other things that were memorable to me as a kid was the traveling circus that would come through town and a, a, an animal friendly circus. But you know, we, we did those types of things um, because it, was, it made memories. And all of the, the 4th of July celebrations, the holiday celebrations, from the Hanukkah happening to um, Christmas on the Square, it, multicultural, multi-religious, multi multi-everything. It was just, there's something for everyone, but not everything is for everyone. When people think of Highlands Ranch, some people, even though they don't know where it is, think of the Highlands Ranch Mansion. <clears throat> there was lots of debate in the early 2000s about what was to become of that property and the 125 acres that it is now in historic property. Right, and it uh, is. What was your take on that period of time? Um, it, you know, I, I guess my take on it, that is a spectacular landmark. Um, when, you, when you look at the history of the people that have owned that and how Highlands Ranch came about, um, you know, the murder at the Brown Palace book and with the Springers, that property is just, it's an incredible um, historical piece. Um, it was completed, I believe, in 1891. The Brown Palace wasn't completed until 1892. So that gives some perspective to people about 
how you know what what value that has in in terms of history. Um, in the early years of my career in Highlands Ranch, um, Mission Video Company and Craig McCallum were very gracious to allow us to do a certain number of community events there every year. And we were a much smaller community at that point in time, so we'd have Halloween parties for adults and uh, Christmas parties. We were allowed to have, you know, our, our Christmas and, and uh, uh, December board meetings and a celebration of our, our community um, at the mansion. And we would do a dinner for our volunteers and the people that kicked in so much all year long and uh, decorated for Hanukkah and Christmas and just, you know, really focus on what was good um, in all ways. And the old historical barns, you know, I, I, I loved going through them and I could tell people, well, this is what this barn is for, but my agricultural background. And this is where the dairy barn was. Here's the horse barn and this is where the calving barn was. Uh, you know, and this is the chicken house, and here is the pigeon house, and uh, you know, it, it just, um, I'm so glad that it's been preserved and taken care of the way it has, and Metro District had the money to do that, and it couldn't have been a whole lot better, so we're very fortunate um, to have that in Highlands Ranch. Mm -hmm. Very true. I understand at one point around that timetable that that land was being considered as a site for what ultimately became Southridge Rec Center. Is that true? Um, there was a small piece of land that was being under consideration. Um, it hadn't, you know, it was under consideration, I'll say it that way. There was a lot of opposition to that, um, primarily from those neighborhoods around there. But, you know, in, in the end, good solutions come from opposition and from understanding. And at the time, then, we, we looked around in other parts of Highlands Ranch, along with Shea Homes. Um, the fourth site had not been identified. There were, in the early plans, there wasn't one, but our community demanded it and wanted it. And we were able to work with Shea Homes and the Metro District uh, to take that piece of property that's, I believe it's five acres where Southridge is at today, um, adjacent to a park and to build that facility there. And when you look at, you know, a, the 5,000 foot view down and the plan with the four centers, that really is a much better place than what would have been close to that historic park. Um, it's just part of the process. Late 2000s, what significant activities were you involved in after Southridge opened? Well, after Southridge opened, the, the last thing that was really on the, the radar for the community association was the, the backcountry wilderness area, what we call it today, and that 8,200 acres. and. Um, in the OSCA agreement, and, and that stood for the Open Space Conservation Area, um, there was a requirement that we would go through a planning process. And it had started um, probably in 1989, I believe is when it was, that the committees said, okay, well, we could do these things here, or these things there, um, perhaps. There was only a small percentage of it that could be developed for any kinds of purposes. Excuse me, whether they be trails or whether it be uh, you know, an equestrian center or a rec center, um, the regional park that Douglas County could construct as part of that land. And so we went through that process and looked at where, where are the, the archaeological resources, where are there geologic resources we shouldn't touch, what's the best wildlife habitat, how do you define the best wildlife habitat, is it in the pinewood forests, is it in the brushlands, is it in the grasslands, there's a mix of all of those things. And those transition zones are where the, the greatest concentrations of wildlife and what they need the most are. So uh, that was really a lot of fun for me. Um, I was involved not only with Highlands Ranch, but the Cherokee Ranch when we put in uh, the first year to develop a, an elk management plan because the elk herds had grown so significantly that they were now damaging the land to the point that not only for erosion, but there would be very few pine trees um, uh, the ponderosa pines that are native to the area because there were so many bull elk that any tree this size just had its bark all raked off by the antlers every fall and so those trees weren't there. And now when you look at the property and after the fire that happened, I believe it was in 2003, uh, uh, that started from a power line out there, you know, it, it really, that land is rejuvenating itself like it's supposed to. Um, you know, sometimes nature takes its play, t does its thing and, and it turns out for the right reasons the right way and, and that's exactly what happened here.
and a lucky hunter gets a permit. Yeah, you know, that was that was part of what we, we tried to do and, and to make that available to, to people in Highlands Ranch at a price point that wasn't, you're not going to have to spend $10,000 to drive to Granby to go hunting. Um, but here's something that we can do for this community for those that would like to and still do it in a managed way so that we culled the herd um, effectively and culled it in a managed way in, in conjunction with Colorado Parks and Wildlife and, and what they thought the carrying capacity of the land could be that mixed with cattle grazing and all of the things that happened there and, and still allow use by the public, or by the members of the association and the regional trail for people to get out and experience without destroying the land. And that was the, the whole goal and the mission behind that. And um, it wasn't taken lightly. I can tell you, and there were a lot of people with a lot of input, um, but at the same time, I think it's a, another one of those great success stories that began with the vision of Mission Viejo Company um, and the Tweet Kimball story. Yeah. <clears throat> Cherokee Ranch Foundation uh, have continued her vision, if right. you will. How were they to work with? You know, they were great. And uh, here's a funny story about. Um, and I call her tweet, I should call her Mrs. Kimball, but she would have grabbed me by the ear if I had. Um, a dear lady and uh, a wonderful person, but I, I remember taking our, I wanted to take our management team from the HRCA up to the, the castle and have just a little half day retreat. And so I, I got in touch with Tweet and she said, yes, Gary, I, that would be fine. I'll have some docents here that can show you around and, and you know, just, Everyone will be respectful and use their manners, I'm sure, as, as Tweet would expect. And I said, absolutely. So we drove up and, you know, uh, I get out and we're walking around and a little bit around the grounds. And I said, Josh, you think they'd pick up those old pots? And I guess I didn't realize the docent was right behind me. And she goes, sir, those are 3,000 years old from the Isle of Crete. You know, so that's when you want to start chewing on your own boot. And the only thing I could think of to say was, gosh, they don't make them like they used to. Um, so, you know, but Tweet was a delightful lady. Um, she had her way of doing things and her vision. Um, great person, though, and a great neighbor to, to the backcountry and Highlands Range. What type of interactions did you have with her? She uh, died in 1999, I believe. Yeah, so, so between 1991 and 1999, I'm, I would meet with Tweet several times a year, plus... You know, she would have certain events that we were invited to and, and with different dignitaries and people that... Would you ever go to Waterloo for been, annual birthday celebration? I, I've been to Waterloo multiple times and I just love it. <laughs> and uh, James are, Holmes is the executive director now and yes. I understand that he's still planning to have that, though her birthday would have been just a few days ago. Yeah, it's in June and, and I believe in September is what James would like to... And they hope it'll he'll be able to celebrate properly then. Right. And we always have to have a toast with a glass of scotch for Tweet, so. <laughs> yeah. she, liked, she, liked her, um, she liked her scotch. She did. <laughs> but what, a, you know, what a wonderful, again, that's another one of those crown jewels in Douglas County that a lot of people don't realize is even there. And uh, it, it is just fabulous. But probably the one thing that Tweet would scold me on, because when we'd stand out on her veranda, um, and you look out over that vast vista to the the west and the northwest. I'd say, but Tweet, Highlands Ranch just starts a quarter mile from the castle. And she said, don't tell people that. <laughs> but it's true. You know, the, the fence line and the boundary is just a quarter mile north of that sure. beautiful the castle. The Douglas Pasture. Mm -hmm. Right. Where there are still some buildings that look like the one behind you here. They do. You know what? So this seems to be in better shape than uh, the failing homestead yeah well the building that's there now. right these logs um, are a little more substantial and, and significant the barn. <laughs> yeah the barn there is substantial <laughs> yeah and the uh, octagonal uh, the silo that's there silo. yes um, and we we would take one right silo well, is in, in remarkably good shape it is um and stacked that way i mean it's yeah. an, an incredible <laughs> piece of construction <laughs> you're all right what it's, I, what over, it's over 100 years old now. Yeah, it is. And, and we would, every year, take um, our delegates and our board out on a tour of the backcountry, those that wanted to go. And so we would rent SUVs and take them out to be able to see um, what was out there for them in the future and for the community. And it was just one of those wonderful things. I remember a couple of the ladies that were in the 
helped start the Historical Society. One of them, Caroline Smith, and I remember giving her a piggyback ride one time because she was, as Carolyn would be, dressed very nicely, and we needed to get her from the old barns <laughs> over to the vehicles, and she had weed seeds all over her, so I was trying to help her out there. Oh, there you go. Yeah, yeah. There, there the steers are. <laughs> uh, I've been fortunate enough that the backcountry people have uh, taken this back there on a few occasions. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I love that old barn that's there because when you go in, and, and this is what I would, and again, it's with my upbringing, I, I, I came from a ranch with one of those old barns just like that, and we maintained it and kept it very well. But where you can see where the horses' hooves, as they came in and out of the doors, would carve out the wood over time, and uh, where the saddle racks would be and the harness holders and uh, the, the feed bunks with the tie-in loops. I mean, it was just, I, I loved that. and. and you know, seeing how the, the hay mow would work up above and the hayloft where, uh, with the pulleys and the, the big forks and just fabulous stuff. Yep, and it is. So what's your thinking for <clears throat> the future of the community association here? You haven't been involved for a decade now. Hey, you know, I, um, <laughs> I, I want the community association and, and the members there to be uber successful we still own a home there and uh i you know i think sometimes when you uh and i did this purposely i, I kind of distanced myself from the association and i was always there to answer questions or offer advice if asked but it i needed to turn over those reins um there was you know the point where i retired from the hrca i i think we'd done all the fun things that were fun for me um, in all the development years, we put together the plans, we accepted all the properties, we built the rec centers and, and took on the backcountry wilderness area and put the management plan in place. And I didn't want to get bored and, and become complacent, so it was time for me to turn those reins over to someone else. And I, I like what's happening in the community. I think that some of the new developments uh, that weren't part of Highlands Ranch originally just add more value to the community. Such as um, what? Um, the, the Central Park area that Shea Holmes did, I mean, that was in the McClellan Foundation property through Inglewood rather than high, it being Highlands Ranch proper, and it wasn't part of the original zoning plan. So, you know, those, those areas are highly utilized, so they've obviously been successful. And the backcountry uh, housing development was a late add-on. Yeah, it was, it, it was the last single-family detached product and, and development to go in. Um, and we worked with Shea Homes. They came to us with an idea and a vision to the, when I say to us, to the board and me about um, building maybe a, a golf course in that area. And that was the time of the Great Recession in 2008 and 9. The association actually sold a future ride in what's the private trail system back there called the South Rim now to the back to Shea Homes. And that allowed the association to have funds for other things that they could do. Um, that land was probably in, almost inaccessible where it was located anyway, so it, you know, it, it turned out good for everybody. And um, the line of where the, the homes are out on the south end of backcountry is an undulating line now. The original development plan had a hard and fast line, and we know what hard and fast lines look like, like in nature. And so what's there today is just incredible uh, in terms of visually and, and how it looks. And, and what was allowed to happen there as a result of those again it was forward thinking and let's uh, forward thinking i should say and how can we make this even better than it is today well there, there's my steers <laughs> we're in a little different phase now that we've approached almost total build out right um i think backcountry was the last area where there were homes to sell and the last lot um there's one lot left today the uh, but it's it's almost completed so final thoughts you know I'd, one of my my favorite movie grouping of all time is, is Lonesome Dove and and there's a spot in there where Augustus McCray says to Captain Collie it's been quite a quite a ride Woodrow that's how I look at my career in Highlands Ranch <clears throat> it was a uh, a fabulous time, and when I retired, we had a little celebration. I shouldn't say we, a little celebration put on. I think I, there were 200 people that stopped by. And one of the Mission Vejo Company gentlemen who then went on to Shea Homes and became very important in that group, uh, in that business afterwards, you know, he got up and said a few words and said, you know, 
back in 1991, there was this young guy that came to town, a cowboy, and we all gave him six months. We bet he wouldn't last more than that. And 20 years later, here we are. So it's been quite a ride. Well, Gary, thank you for sharing your thoughts on your 20 years of time uh, with HRCA, a very important organization in the history of Highlands Ranch. Well, thank so, you. Thank you again. You're welcome. And, you know, it's been my pleasure. And, and frankly, I ought to be applauding what the Highlands Ranch Historical Society is doing. You know, I, I was never one to think much about, you know, someday this is going to be history. <laughs> but it is. And it's, and it's cool history. So, well done. Jamie, Jamie Noble, who uh, still works for HRCA, uh, has joined our board recently here. <laughs> and with the uh, pandemic that we're undergoing right now, the last couple of calls have been on um, Zoom, but she's participated and phoned from her cabin up in the mountains someplace. <laughs> and she said some interesting things to say. <laughs> guess going forward on this too, but she's been um, a good addition to our board. Uh, I asked her on that call and reminded her that next year, 2021, will be the 40th yeah. anniversary of the first homeowner buying a house on Islands Ranch. And <laughs> I asked her, what is HRCA doing? And her initial comment was, well, at the moment, given what you'd said earlier, let's plan for the next year, much less five years. We're just trying to get through the current situation with the pandemic. But she and I'm sure the Metro District and other people will be thinking about what do we do for the 40th anniversary, which is yeah. coming up next year. That would be, you know, um, I, I think that's really a, a great point. And, you know, I, I remember... Um, when we started the 4th of July parade, which that was again one of those things that Jamie and I worked on, and I, I can't say enough about Jamie and how much energy she puts into life and Highlands Ranch. Um, but those parades, I every year I would ride my horses. Um, I'd have my daughter with me. We'd <laughs> it was just so much fun, and I hope maybe that parade celebration can honor some of the people that that helped put all of this together. And um, you know, yeah, it, I hope so too. That would be something that should really happen. Yeah, some of those founders are in their 80s and even 90s now. Mm -hmm. Jim Teffer, I know, is just about 92. Art Cook's well into his 80s. Yeah. Other Gary Danny, I don't know how old Gary is, but um, I, he still lives in Highlands Ranch, by the way. Yeah, I, I'm. And I see him at the rec centers. <laughs> and, um, I'm friends with him on Facebook. From time to time. <laughs> yeah, yep, they're all, and those are all really class gentlemen that you just mentioned yeah. and, uh, and and i think of the ladies and gentlemen that i've had the opportunity to work with over the years and it's just they, they taught me so much i mean i sometimes got praise for things but it was because i learned from somebody else that taught me and that's i think the true testament of a good community good well again thank you you're welcome hopefully i didn't bore you to death not at all <laughs>